Recently, I've been trying to pinpoint what I'm drawn to in the artists I love. And I know it starts with noticing someone has talent, but to really fall for an artist, I need to fall for their personality. And I do that by watching interviews. Personally, I've always been drawn to the celebrities that seem like they aren't completely out of touch. The ones that seem like real people. And being a real person means talking about all aspects of life, which sometimes involves pain. I have a special place for artists that are brave enough to be vulnerable about their struggles, and honest enough to admit when they've messed up. I think Shia LaBeouf represents all these characteristics, and that's why he's one of my favorite celebrities. Shia is a 33-year-old actor who has seemingly already had 9 lives. He's been in the spotlight since he was a kid, and he's lived out multiple creative pursuits and existential breakdowns all in front of the public. Despite his mistakes, he's always had a charisma and candor that is refreshing. And that comes down to him seeming like a really genuine person. Regardless of your opinion on him, one thing can't be denied. Shia is fascinating. It's Shia LaBeouf, lurking in the shadows. Hollywood superstar Shia LaBeouf. I just put in that light there, and that disco ball. So the light reflects off the disco ball. Sure goes fast. Fast. <laughs> now we're going fast. It's gonna blow. Oh, 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 okay, hey, 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 what are you doing? Nathan, not. Get the fuck out of here. Yesterday, said tomorrow. So just do it. Make your dreams come true. Just. Do it! Shia grew up in Echo Park, a majority Latino neighborhood near downtown LA. He described his parents as hippies, stating that they were pretty weird people, but they loved me and I loved them. His father Jeffrey was a Vietnam War veteran and worked many jobs. He was a stand-up comic for a while, a rodeo clown, and a drug trafficker that would crop marijuana on the sides of freeways. Shia's mother Shayna was a former ballet dancer from New York. He described her as the backbone of his family, saying people would confide in her because she had dealt with so much in her life and managed to remain stable. To get by, Shia and his parents would dress up as clowns and go into town and sell hot dogs. If the family didn't sell the day's hot dogs, that was what they ate for dinner. When Shia was just five, his father checked into a veteran's hospital for a heroin and alcohol addiction and his parents split. Shia said he got bullied early on in school, so he developed a sense of humor and a knowledge of hip hop to survive. Hip hop became the thing. It was like you had to break dance, you had to have jokes, uh -huh. your mama was big, <laughs> them Yo Mama books had just come out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you went home, you memorized all them Yo Mama jokes, and you had to have snaps, you had to break dance, you had to be able to freestyle, or you're getting beaten up every day. Mm -hmm. It was a survival thing. And I was the only white kid, really, in my neighborhood, because uh, everybody else was pretty Mexican. So I, I used to shave the back of my head, and I had bangs, and I used to comb my bangs back and wear brown corduroys and big white t-shirts, and I tried to be like a Mexican. He didn't see his father much in the years following the divorce, but his dad helped him hone a stand-up routine that he performed in comedy clubs around LA when he was 10 years old. He said, quote, I had to be as disgusting and vulgar as possible. That was the whole shtick. The idea of acting came to Shia when he went surfing one day in Malibu. I used to surf uh, in Malibu at this place where you had needed a key to get in. It's called Point Doom. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, a friend of mine had the key, and my friend also knew uh, a kid who was on Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. And he had like this really fresh Doyle board, like all brand new clothes, a Game Boy, the light up shoes. I was like, this guy is living the life. Right. Who are his parents? Right. And then I found out that it wasn't his parents, it was him. And he had gotten a gig on the show. And I'm going, well, I need the light up shoes now. Right. So to him, this wasn't about the acting. It was a way to get a better life. Shia's mother said she'd support his dreams. But if he wanted to be an actor, he would need to make it happen himself. 
So that's what he did. He started calling agents pretending to be a middle-aged talent manager from England. He said, quote, I had this fake resume and all this garbage material. It was such a ridiculous phone call, and they knew it was a kid, but my agent was interested because she'd never received a call like that. She thought, it's, you know, you really need to have so you got to be a bold person to do something like yeah. that. And then um, they asked me to come in, and I read a, a Burger King commercial, and she said, good to she go. She took you on, and she yeah. is still your agent today. Correct. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Early on, his agent helped him get a few small appearances on ER and The X-Files. But his big break happened when he was 13 and landed an audition for Lewis, a troublemaker younger brother on a Disney Channel show called Even Stevens. Somewhere with Even Stevens at the audition, you scared the other actors who were waiting their audition by telling them, I got so it wrapped bad. up, it's mine. <laughs> I, I wanted it so bad, I would like walk around, I was like, listen man, I know what you're auditioning for, I already got the part, you know. And I did, I eventually got it, it all lucky. And their faces, of course, all dropped. All dropped. Shia speaks very fondly of his time on this show, stating that it eliminated his fear of being in front of cameras. You put your hand out, right? Do this with me. You okay. put your hand out, you're looking at your hand. Yeah and then make the background disappear. Like you can focus enough on that hand to where everything else sort of disappears. It's like this supreme focus. And then you can zoom out on the, you can zoom out on the hand and then I can see you. You know, you, you can start playing with your focus that way. <laughs> I don't know if that's like a good analogy of what even Stevens gave me, but it, it freed me up in front of cameras. Yeah. It took away the fear of being in front of a camera. It, it made a camera my friend. It was like recess. Uh, it was like a playground. During the shooting of Even Stevens, Shia had to have a parent on set. So his father took the job. We moved in a, mo a motel in uh, Playa del Rey next to the uh, Fox Hills Mall. And we're living there for four years. And that's how I got to know my dad. Wow. So it was like rent a dad. Shia saw lots of drugs during this period, including marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. He said his dad gave him his first joint when he was 11 or 12. Because of his upbringing, LaBeouf never felt like he fit in with Disney. He said, quote, they would invite the Hillary Duffs and Miley Cyruses to go to the Jonas Brothers concert, and I'd be there with my friends, but we were outsiders. Even Stevens ran for three years and culminated in Shia earning a daytime Emmy in 2003. When the show ended, Shia felt immense pressure because his parents weren't working. He was the breadwinner and had to support his family financially. He said he lucked out when he landed his first movie role, playing Stanley Yelnats in Holes a film based off the 1998 best-selling novel. Shia said Holes was where the acting thing really started. Before that, it was a profession. After he met John Voight on set, it became an art. I did a movie called Holes when I was like real young, uh, and I met a guy named John Voight, and he didn't have no family. Uh, you know, dude was lonely. I was pretty lonely, you know. My family's all fucked up too, so we just got on. We we're watching movies. He showed me a movie called Coming Home that he had done, where he's playing a veteran coming back from Vietnam, and then talked me through what he did to get there and what it meant to him. And he made it sound like magic, like magic tricks, like when I'm talking about DiCaprio and Hoffman. So he made it more than just some hustle. Following Holes, Shy starred in the Even Stevens movie and The Greatest Game Ever Played. He also had roles in several movies including Dumb and Dumberer, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, and I, Robot. Things really started to change when Shy landed a leading role in Disturbia. In the film, Shy plays a teen who is placed on house arrest and begins to spy on his neighbors and believes one of them is a possible killer. The director, DJ Caruso, said he picked Shy for the role because girls would like him because he's smart and gets cuter the more you watch him, and guys would like him because he's cool and wasn't such a pretty boy. Disturbia spent three weeks in the number one box office spot. Steven Spielberg, one of the film's executive producers, was so impressed with LaBeouf's audition tape that he had him read for another DreamWorks picture, Transformers. Again, Shy landed the leading role, this time as Sam Witwicky, who teams up with Optimus Prime to save the Earth from the Decepticons. Transformers was the fifth highest grossing film of 2007, making it LaBeouf's second number one movie of the year. After Disturbia and Transformers, Spielberg added LaBeouf to his all-star team for the fourth installment in the Indiana Jones series, where he plays Indiana's son and sidekick. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull opened at number one in the box office by grossing a whopping $101 million in the opening weekend. 
So in just a few years, Shy had gone from a Disney child actor to a Hollywood A-lister. <laughs> Indiana Jones movie. Our first guest is one of the busiest young actors around. Please welcome Shia LaBeouf. Please welcome Shia LaBeouf. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shia LaBeouf. In a short amount of time, Shia achieved what he thought would be a dream come true. But in reality, he was having a difficult time adjusting to fame and dealing with critics. So drinking became his way of silencing the noise. He said, quote, I grew up with this idea, if you got to work with Spielberg, that's where it is. And then you get there and realize you're not meeting the Spielberg you dreamed of. You're meeting him at a different stage in his career. He's less a director than he is a company. You don't chase it anymore like, like oh, I need the Transformers, I need nah, that. No, I ran from it because it was not serving me. It was destroying me. That's when I, I was getting that. really drunk and fucked up. That was all during that time when I just felt like I was becoming soulless. Mm. You know, I couldn't navigate myself anymore. I just felt like I, like I, was, I was dissipating. Shia has had several run-ins with the law including an arrest in 2007 when he refused to leave a Walgreens, a misdemeanor for drunk driving in 2008, a bar fight in 2011, and possibly most notorious was the public incident where he became drunk and disorderly at a New York showing of Cabaret, where he refused to leave the theater. He yelled, swore, and even spat at police officers. After this arrest, Shia finally decided to seek treatment for his alcoholism. One way of working through his problems was by collaborating with two European artists on a dozen hashtag-driven performance art projects. The goal of these projects was to infuse the real with the digital, all in the pursuit of creating real connections. A few notable projects include hashtag I am sorry, where for a week straight from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m., Shia allowed visitors into an art gallery to interact with him one at a time. Outside the gallery, guests were offered items like a leather whip, pliers, a pink ukulele, and a Transformers figure. On multiple occasions, both visitors and Shia ended up in tears. Hashtag Take Me Anywhere was a project where Shia and his two collaborators hit the road by hitchhiking for a solid month. The group relied on rides by tweeting their GPS coordinates and getting in the car with whoever showed up. Shia's personal favorite performance art project was Hashtag All My Movies, where LaBeouf camped out at the Angelica Film Center in New York City and invited visitors to join him free of charge as he watched every movie he ever appeared in. This event was live streamed and took three full days to complete. That All My Movies thing was a real galvanizer for me. I was at a low spot, so when everybody came in and started watching all that stuff with me, it wasn't even about the movies. It was just like, uh, it was like instant friends. Mm -hmm. I've been lonely for a long time, you know, especially if you, if you work in this business, I'm sure you could attest. Uh, you get to a certain level where it's hard to to make friends anymore. Yeah. You know, there used like to be a real time, friends. Yeah, real friends. Mm -hmm. It used to, be, used to be a time when I was young and you could just go up to anybody and be like, hey, you want to make friends, want to be friends? Yeah. You know, like when you were young and, and like four years old, I remember like running upstairs on all fours, those times, you know, mm -hmm. like the innocent times. And, and that goes away pretty quick. And I've been in this for a long time. So I really started doing that performance work as sort of a way to, to, to humanize myself and make mm -hmm. friends, you know? It really started there. When Shia went back to acting, he made a pledge to choose roles that were chasing sincerity, like those taken by his heroes, Gary Oldman, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Joaquin Phoenix. He turned down offers to appear in The Social Network, 127 Hours, and The Bourne Legacy, and instead opted for characters who were like him, young men in existential crises. Shia starred in films that include Lawless, Charlie Countryman, Fury, Borg vs. McEnroe, and American Honey. American Honey's a really gripping A24 film, where LaBeouf stars as the leader of a gang of nomad misfit kids who sell magazine subscriptions around the country. Most recently, Shia starred in a sleeper hit called Peanut Butter Falcon. This film follows a young man with Down syndrome who escapes from an assisted living facility and befriends Shia's character, who is a fisherman on the run. 
Both Peanut Butter Falcon and American Honey are critically acclaimed, with Shia earning the best reviews of his entire career. When you have to make a movie for a big general audience, you have to be less specific. Right. And the less specific you are, the less meat you have to chew on. Right. The less meat you have to chew on, the less interesting it is for the actor. Right. So I I'm not gonna shit on nothing, but but yeah, I've just found my way to one survive. Yep. Uh, and two be able to flourish. Yeah. You know, I feel like my best stuff is coming the last five years, and none of that was studio work. And that takes us to where we are today, with Shia's latest film coming out on November 8th. It's called Honey Boy, a film based on his childhood and his abusive relationship with his father. The title refers to his dad's nickname for him. In the film, Shia plays his father and wrote the screenplay while he was in rehab in 2017, where he was diagnosed with PTSD. I mean, Shia was in rehab at the time and he sent it to me and I uh, kind of literally had to drop anything I was doing the minute I read it. It was kind of the best thing I've ever read and it was um, urgency to it and I could understand how, what his step, step is about to take playing his dad, which seemed kind of dangerous to me in a way and like really bold. I, don't, I know a lot of people that in a stable state of mind wouldn't be able to tackle that kind of idea and knowing that he's gonna do that was just, uh, it just seemed like the coolest shit I can ever be doing with my life at that point. I remember when I first sent it, I wasn't trying to play my dad. I wasn't even trying to act in it. Sure. Yeah, I sent it to her with, under the auspices that it was just something I was writing. I wasn't, she talked me into playing my dad. Coming out of rehab, his team advised him not to work on the project because of how difficult the material was. My whole like professional team was not with it. Yeah. Yeah, they were not wanting me to do this. But you do what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it was sort of like I didn't have a whole lot to lose, you know? Why do you say that? Well, I was in a, you know, wild spot in my life. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it informed everything that went down. You know, you ask for permission when you have something to protect. And so I was in a spot where I didn't have much to protect and I think it informed the performance. Two weeks ago, I rented a car and drove to the Mill Valley Film Festival where Shia and Alma were making an appearance at the film's premiere. I waited in line for two hours and managed to get a pass inside. One, two, go! We just, we just did one. Tell her, tell her. I can't move! <laughs> Even though the film is about Shia's childhood, when you watch it, you can't help but reflect on your own upbringing. And I think inevitably, everyone's parents have fucked them up in some way. The film is vulnerable and honest, and must have been extremely cathartic for LaBeouf. After the screening, he got on stage and said his intense desire to make the film was the only way he would have ever made right with his father. I mean, I never told him I was going to play him until we were already geared up to go. Because uh, I needed to sign this paperwork and there's no way... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would read him um, four or five scenes a day, and then that went on for about a week, just reading scenes and talking stuff out. Uh, and uh, that was a whole world experience. Uh, but yeah, that came that came out of uh, going to build a relationship with my dad again, which I don't know if I would have done had it had I not had it not been under the auspices of this craft that I really love. Because I think I love this craft more than anything or anyone in my life. And so, uh, back against the wall, thinking, fuck, I'm never going to work again. I think that was the only way to get me to open up to my father. And it was such a strange setup where it's like, all right, well, if you want to do this thing that you love a lot, then you've got to make right with this man. And that just felt like a fucking gun to your head, you know? Uh, and I don't know, I'm stubborn. I don't know if I'd have done it any other way. Shia offered some potent advice for children of alcoholics. Uh, don't waste your pain. Yeah, don't waste it, you know, it's a useful paint. Yeah. Shia seems to be happier than he's ever been, and that's a credit to his work and the people he has around him. Last year, Shia opened up a free theater company in a marginalized area of LA with the goal of giving this community another way to express itself. Small, simple things that'll change the world, right? So right. around here, you don't have a lot of uh, existential time in general, right? Right. So, so what we're trying like to do is actually, simple in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's ba basically survival. Out yeah, here. exactly. There's no time for how do I feel, what do I think at all. So you don't wind up with a lot of 
you know, creative outlets, period. You have a lot of meritocracy in the sports and whatnot, but you don't have a lot of like, how do I feel, what do I think at all. So every Saturday you're here. Yes. It's a five hour class. Anybody's welcome, non-actors welcome. Yeah, everybody's welcome. Through the ups and downs, Shia now recognizes his career as one of his greatest gifts. And while there's no question that Shia's story is unique, a good deal of what he went through feels relatable. And maybe that comes down to his storytelling and his honesty. I think that's the big takeaway. Sincerity and truth are extremely powerful. Sharing gives others a chance not only to understand you better, but also a chance to see themselves in your experiences. Truth is, truth is infectious. It's, uh, you know, it, it's addictive. Mm -hmm. Sincerity, truth is addictive. And that's why, that's why you have the following you have. That's why I've, I've been chasing what I've been chasing is I'm trying to get back to like authenticity. We made it to the end. Thanks for watching the video, guys. Man, Shia is such a cool cat. Working on this project for the past month has really inspired me to be more transparent in my daily interactions. I've picked up the phone and called some friends that I haven't talked to in years, and that's been super special. I think I'm just working on being more intentional. So two quick things before you go. First is that you should check out my Spotify. I've curated several playlists based off artist bios I've created, along with some mood playlists and one with my favorite songs of the moment that I am updating constantly. So you can find my Spotify by searching for Jake Zeman and going to my public playlist. I'll also include that link in the bio. Second is that I created some dad hats with a planet on them because I wanted a dad hat with a planet on it. So yeah, you can buy one at www.jakezeman.com and that link will also be in the bio. And they're an easy way to support my channel because most of these videos do get copyrighted. Uh, and some exciting news, there are going to be some shirts coming out very, very soon. So be on the lookout for those. You can also find me on Instagram by searching my name, Jake Zeman, and I'll put that link in the bio as well. So thanks again for the support and all the love. Much, much more to come. Peace.